Uh, so my name's Johnny Healy, or Reverend Johnny Healy, as I'm known in some circles. Uh, Revnal on Gmail or on Twitter, feel free to follow me or send me an email if you have any questions about this presentation. So I'm here to talk to you about Ply. So what is Ply? It's Python, Lex, and Yak. Uh, so is anyone here familiar with Lex and Yak? Okay. Uh, are you familiar with the Python version or just the C version? Okay, so we have one person. Excellent. We need your help. That's why we're here. <laughs> so uh, Lex is a lexical analyzer generator. And uh, what is lexical analysis? It's just sort of a way of taking a string of characters and tokenizing it. So you break it up into different tokens and you quantify those tokens, you describe them as, you know, you know, some might be integers or strings or symbols or things like that, uh, depending on what it is you're trying to tokenize. Uh, so let's say you wanted to tokenize the string Lex is fun. That's uh, a simple string. So depending on how you define your tokenizer, it'll generate something like this, where you know words get described as text and then you have spaces. So we have the word lex, a space, the word is, another space, the word fun, and then finally some punctuation, which in this case is an exclamation, because it's that much fun. Now, yak. That is yet another compiler compiler, which is kind of a silly name, um, and it goes way back in like the history of Unix lore that someone was writing a compiler and it's actually kind of tricky to write a compiler by hand It's not recommended and so what they end up writing is a compiler compiler in this case it was designed to work with C and so it allows them to define a high, define in an abstract language what the structure of their particular text should look like and how it should be parsed and then the compiler compiler <laughs> compiles that to C code or in this case to Python code that uh, is capable of parsing. And I'll go into a bit more as to what grammars, like what kinds of grammars can be parsed by a compiler compiler. Uh, so, why is it that I started using Ply? Uh, well, a couple of years ago, a group of friends of mine and I, we uh, had this old message board software that was written in PHP and it got crufty. And we decided to rewrite it in Django because a lot of us were familiar with Python. And one of the things we wanted was a BB code uh, parsing engine. So BB code is just a simple markup language for bulletin boards. It uses the uh, square brackets to wrap around things. So you can you know, have bold text, or italic text, or URLs. And uh, it's a relatively simple markup language, and it's fairly widely used. <laughs> so uh, you may be thinking, problem solved, uh, and try parsing DB code with uh, regular expressions. And I will tell you now to never, ever do this. Uh, regular expressions are useful, but they have certain limitations, and one of them is that they're very bad at parsing recursive grammars. Uh, and BB code happens to be recursive, because you can have nested tags. You can have a bold tag and then italic tags within that for text that's bold and italic. And so if you try using a regex to parse this, then uh, you know that makes Baby Dykstra cry. Uh, so don't do that. Now I'm going to throw some math at you, because I know everyone here loves math, right? Raise your hand if you love math. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about some formal language theory. So uh, what is formal language theory? It's this area of math and computer science that is meant for dealing with languages. So a language consists of an alphabet, which is some set of symbols. And then there are strings, which is any ordered set of symbols. So you might have, you know, one after the other. And then some series of rules that are used to describe what is a well-formed string. And the idea is that anything that is a well-formed string is considered part of that, part of that abstract language, and anything that's not well-formed isn't part of that language. So any series of symbols that doesn't fit 
the patterns or the rules is not in the language. So uh, what would be a simple abstract language that's easy to understand? Well, we need an alphabet, and we have a very good alphabet, letters from A to Z. Uh, it's widely used. And let's create a simple rule, which is any string that appears in the dictionary is considered well-formed. So any dictionary word you can say is well-formed. And this would be a very simple language. Be easy to, you know, find some well-formed strings, like hello or world. And these are easy to look up in the dictionary, and you can verify that they're in the language. But then there are also strings that aren't well-formed. So they're composed out of the same symbols, but, you know, a string of W's or a bunch of words crammed together into a single word, those aren't actual words. They're just, they're not part of the language, the abstract theoretical language. So uh, there are different kinds of languages that can be described with formal language theory. And I'm going to discuss two of them today. One of those is regular languages, and the other is context-free languages. And these are both very important concepts to understand for uh, understanding how to write a parser. And I'm going to give you examples of a regular language and of a context-free language. And I'll use a simple alphabet containing three symbols, A, B, and C. So uh, regular languages are really some of the most simple languages that you can define using formal language theory. Uh, they're fairly well studied. They're well understood, and uh, they support a series of rules that you can use to construct a language. So you would have a symbol. A symbol by itself can be a rule. You can say, this symbol must appear in the language. Or a concatenation. So you can concatenate two symbols together and say these two symbols belong to each other, or concatenate several symbols and state that those have to you know, exist together to be part of the language. There's a union operation. So you can have one symbol or another symbol, or one concatenation of symbols, or another concatenation of symbols, or you can have a bunch of different unions. And then there's this fancy thing called the clean star, which it just allows you to repeat a rule. Now, uh, this would be an example of a regular language. So here we have A and B concatenate together, or B and C concatenate together, and the whole thing is wrapped in a clean star, so it can be looped. So this language can define a couple of different strings, or actually it can define an infinite number of strings since it loops indefinitely. But uh, So here we can see our first string has the AB and then a BC, then a BC and an AB, following the you know, possible patterns in the language. The other one's just a series of BCs. But these are a bunch of strings that don't go in there, like A, B, C, or A, B, C. Because every A has to be followed by a B, um, and then there are also Bs that have to be followed by Cs. So you can't just have a bunch of As, a bunch of Bs, and a bunch of Cs. So uh, that probably looks really familiar if you know regular expressions, because regular expressions are based on regular languages. Now, modern regular expression engines have all sorts of other features added to them, which allow you to do all sorts of non-regular <coughs> things. But for the most part, many ideas can be represented with regular expressions that map to regular languages. But like I said before, regular languages have this limitation, which is that they can't express a recursive structure. For that, we need context-free languages. <coughs> so uh, context-free languages are described by what's called a context-free grammar uh, that can be composed of two different types of elements. You've got terminal elements, and a terminal is either a symbol or an empty string, uh, which is denoted by epsilon, and I'll show you what that looks like. Or there are non-terminals. And non-terminals are essentially a rule that is composed of a series of terminals and non-terminals. And it also supports concatenation and union. And actually with those, and with the fact that it does recursion, you can do looping. So in reality, a context-free language is a superset of regular languages. Like 
any, any regular language can be described in a context-free grammar. So here, here's a simple example of a context-free grammar. So here we have two different non-terminals named X and Y. So X matches two possible patterns. It can either be A with another X in between, or followed by a C, or it can be a Y. And then a Y is described as a B and a C that are wrapping another Y, or there's epsilon, so there's the you know, empty string. And this looks a little bit scary, but you know, it, it's actually uh, really, once you start playing around with them, they're not too difficult to understand. So here are some strings that are well formed within this language. So we have an A and a B and a C and a C. So if you think about it, the first A and the last C, those are both uh, based on the X non-terminal. And then inside of that, there's another X which becomes a Y, and that Y is a B and a C. And then the second one is pretty much the same thing, but there's another X stuck on there, another A and C wrapping it. And these are some strings that aren't well formed. And so as you can see, there's an A and a C at the end, and there's a B and a C in the middle, but then there's sort of like that extra B in there. And then ABC is another one that this didn't work in our regular language, and it doesn't work in our context-free grammar. Now, you might be looking at this, and it might not seem apparent that the context-free languages are any more powerful than regular languages. I mean, I'm building it out of the same elements. It's all just A's, B's, and C's. So uh, if you still don't believe me, I'm offering a simple challenge. So this context-free grammar has a rather neat property. Every time an A is added to the beginning, a C is added to the end. And every time a B is added, another C is added in the middle. So if you look at all of the strings that are accepted in this language, you can take the number of A's and the number of B's, add them together, and that will be the number of C's. So if you really want to challenge, try doing this with a regular expression, and you will find that it doesn't work. You can't create a language that's just some number of A's followed by some number of B's, and then a number of C's equal to the number of A's plus B's. It's just not possible to do with regular languages. So, I'm done with the math now. Um, the math wasn't strictly necessary, but it should help make some, make some sense out of some of the other stuff. Uh, and so how does this formal language theory, how does it apply to apply? Well, Lex, our lexical analyzer, is based on the idea of regular languages. You provide it with a series of regular languages, and it uses those to create tokens. And then those tokens are fed to Yak, which uses context-free languages to describe the overall structure of the language. So Lex. Let's look at how Lex works, at least the Python Lex. Uh, you start by defining a series of regular expressions. So. For these examples, I'm going to go back to BB code, and we're going to look at how to do bold tags, italic tags, and URL tags. So here we have opening and closing bold tags. And for this, it actually just uses the regular Python uh, regular expression library. So you don't have to learn a new syntax for this stuff. You can just use the existing Python knowledge that you have in Python documentation. So we have opening and closing B tags, we have opening and closing I tags, opening and closing URLs. And then for text, I'm cheating and saying anything that doesn't start with a, uh, you know, opening bracket is text. Or in fact, anything that doesn't contain an opening bracket is text. And if we wanted to, we can make that rule a bit more powerful to allow it to do some other stuff, uh, to parse, I don't know, malformed things. <coughs> So within that same file, we need to define a variable named tokens, which just contains a, a, a tuple of the names of all of these. And so if you notice, these variables all are prefixed with T underscore. Uh, and then the tokens are the same names, just without that prefix. And then you call the lex.lex function to create your lexer. 
Now this is a bit weird because I'm not actually feeding this function any input. There are no arguments being passed to it. And in fact, Lex, both Lex and Yak in Python do some weird things which seem unpythonic in my opinion. And this is one of them, which is that there's a bit of magic going on here where it introspects the file, it reads the tokens tuple that you described, and then it maps that to the series of regular expressions. So rather than be ex explicitly passing stuff to it to create your lexer, you just sort of say, create the lexer, and it figures out what to do based on where you call it. So let's have a quick demo of lex. So, so here we have from ply import lex. We have our tuple of tokens. And then we have the regular expressions that we use to describe those tokens. There's this little error thing here. And this is one of the nice things that ply can do. Uh, for both the lexer and the parser, you can put error handling in. So you can either have this raise an error, or you can, in this case, it just sort of skips any token that it doesn't understand. And you can do some nice more complex stuff with that. So here we have it calling, you know, lexer equals lex.lex. And so now it reads this file, or it actually just introspects the module and says, you know, here are my tokens, I can create a lexer. <coughs> so I'll import the lexer. So then, to actually have it tokenize something, we would just say lexer.lexer.input. <coughs> lexer being the name of our lexer. And I'll give it a little bit of text. <coughs> and then the lexer also <coughs> is treated as an iterable. So you can just say uh, token for token in lexer. And then it actually uh, gives you a list of all the tokens. So as you can see, based on the input text that it was given, it found three different tokens. There's one that's opening a bold tag, there's some text, and then there's one that's closing a bold tag. So if you really wanted to, you could do all of this stuff by hand, <clears throat> like create a series of regular expressions and then actually have something that goes through and does the tokenization and write all that code. But this is nice, it does it for you, and then it's designed so that these tokens very easily can be uh, provided to Yak so it can actually do the parsing. <coughs> so, as I mentioned before, Yak is based on this idea of a context-free language. And so in this context-free language that we're about to describe for Yak, the tokens from the lexical analyzer are acting as the symbols in our language. So we're taking a series of these tokens, and then we're creating, describing non-terminals composed of these and of each other. And just to you know, go against what all the mathematics people do where non-terminals are capitalized, uh, conveniently in Yak, the non-terminals are lowercase and the tokens are capitalized. <coughs> so, this is another thing I find a little unpythonic. Yak describes the rules of the grammar in doc strings. So for our uh, language here, for our BB code interpreter, we would want something called content that can read either tagged or untagged items. And this is how you would define it in the context-free grammar. You would say content right here, this is our non-terminal. It's composed of more content followed by tagged content, so that would be another non-terminal, which I'll show you in a minute. Or it could be content followed by text, <laughs> text being a string from our tokenizer. Or it can just be blank. So content can be empty. And if you look at this, this content thing can sort of, this can represent all of the different structure we need to parse BB code. 
So we. Uh, I'll get to the P. I'll, I'll get to the P in a minute. So the P is actually the parser, and so you can do. It gets passed along, and you can do processing based on that. But the idea is that this, since it's recursively defined in this structure, we can just sort of have any number of sort of iterations of the content, um, <coughs> the content non-terminal. And it can have a series of tagged or untagged items. <coughs> Not yet. So something else is, given our parser generator, um, this is something you generally don't want to do, which is have the recursion on the right. Now, this just happens to be uh, this particular style of this popular style of parser generator, which is the idea is a left recursive parser generator, or actually a look ahead left recursive. It'll look ahead one token, and then it can recurse on the left side, but you don't really want it to be recursing on the right side because that'll create all sorts of ambiguity in certain conditions, or it'll be less efficient in some cases. And um, if you do things that irritate it, it won't raise very useful error messages. It will tell you about a shift reduce conflict, which is like way out there in like, I don't know, parser generator theory. So you don't need to know about that. Just if you start seeing weird things, make sure your recursion is going on on the right. So let's look back at this for a minute. And uh, how do we process this? Or let's look at what tag means. So we have content. One of the things is tagged, which is another non-terminal. And in this case, tagged is either tagged bold, tagged italic, or tagged URL. So something else you also might notice is the function names that I'm using here. They map to the names of the non-terminal that it's describing with a P prefix. The P is for parser. So then we have our tag bold, tag italic, and tag URL stuff. And so these are fairly straightforward. So tag bold, you're just opening a bold tag. You have more content, so it's back to the content object that can be recursively nested. So you can have you know, an italic one inside of that. And then we have our tag i stuff, which is opening, content, closing. And then for URL, I decided not to nest the content because this gets pasted into a um, you know, anchor tag, and we don't want the URL to have <coughs> BB code in it because that would look good and not work. So we've, de we've described our grammar here. But how do we go about and process it? Well, this is where that P object comes in. Um, it's actually significant because the parser generator, when it sees p underscore, it says, "Oh, this is yeah, this is something I need to process." So the p object can be treated as sort of as an array or a list, and the idea is p zero is always your left side non-terminal. And then, so your first item, in this case an open bracket, would be P1, content would be P2, and then the closed bracket would be P3. And what we have access to for this content is the actual content that was parsed when it was processed. And the opening and closing brackets are actually just, uh, yeah. The opening and closing brackets, those are just the raw <coughs> strings that of the tokens, so the the you know square bracketed Bs are in there, and so what we want to do is we want to assign a value to P zero, and say that this particular tag B instance contains. In this case, we want a string that has you know our regular HTML angle brackets wrapping around this other string which contains the content. 
And so if this content contains you know, a tagged i item in it, then that tagged i item will end up containing a string wrapped in i's, and that just gets placed back in here. And then for, uh, for this particular one, the tagged one, this is really simple because everything on the right side just has one item, and the left side, you know, it's basically just, this is basically a fancy or operation. And since by the time it gets to execute this code, this tagged b, tagged i, and tagged url have all been processed and turned into strings, then we end up just assigning that string value to tagged. Now the content one gets a bit trickier because if we look at the content one, there can be, you know, two possible items or zero possible items in the case where the empty string matches. Well, conveniently our p object, we can just sort of treat it <coughs> like a list and we can ask what the length is. So if the length is three, meaning we have, you know, our item zero, which is content, and then we'll have one of two possible other things. And then uh, if our string is three, then we just take the two things and add them together. Because whether it's content or whether it's text, what we're being given here is going to be two strings. Just concatenate them, assign them to P0. And if there's nothing, then we just return nothing. Well, we don't return nothing. We uh, assign an empty string to P0. Now, the parser generator also needs something called main, which just tells it where to start parsing. And in this case, our main is just content, and we assign p0 to p1. So after you define that, then you would just call it yak.yak, .yak, and it does that fancy thing again where it analyzes the module that you're calling it from. It finds all the p functions, and it creates the structure based on those. It creates the parser generator based on those. So let's see it in action. And so this is what it looks like. Uh, we want to import our tokens from the lexer. And then from ply, we import yak. We have our whole series here. And actually, I probably should have shown what the URL one looks like. But this is what it looks like. And so as you can see, it takes the text, and it sticks it both within the uh, href <laughs> attribute and as the text so that, you know, Whatever the URL is, it will appear as itself clickable. And then we say generate our parser. <coughs> so assigning things to P0 is kind of like the return statement. It's kind of like the return statement, right. yeah. So here it's giving me a warning because I didn't define P error, so if there's an error in the parsing, it will throw an error instead of trying to gracefully resolve it. And then it tells us that it's generating our look ahead uh, left recursive uh, tables. So now, parser.parse. So now we just give the string to parse. This is bold and italic. And as you can see, what it ends up returning is text that's wrapped in bold and italic, where it wants to be italic. Now, this is the other little ugly bit about uh, ply, which is that uh, it's not just it's not just on the fly creating this. Well, it is on the fly creating the parser, uh, but it's also storing it in this parse tab file. So we get some nice. We get some nice automatically generated Python code, which is pretty much yeah. It's but that was supposed to be a seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, I think it even has a warning up here. Yeah, do not edit. Um, so this actually ended up biting me a bit 
because <clears throat> like I said, we were running this in a Django app, and we needed to make sure there was a writable location for it to actually spit out this parse tab file. And so when we were first testing this out, you know, it works locally on your machine when you're running it as you, and then you deploy it to a server, and suddenly it can't write where it wants to, and things start throwing 500 errors. <laughs> So that is the end of my presentation. That is how you can use uh, Ply to create a parser for whatever you want. And if anyone's interested, uh, my friend's GitHub has this. Orchestrator is our message board. And then BB King is the name of my um, BB code parser. So if you want a Django friendly BB code parser. And of course, it's named after a musician because it's Django. <laughs> Okay. Questions? Questions? Uh, what are the alternatives to this? Oh. <laughs> uh, so there, there are several alternatives. Um, I think I typed in Python parser generator, and this came up first, which is why I ended up using it. <laughs> but uh, you are welcome to explore whatever alternatives you want and do a presentation on them. <laughs> yes. Does it put the tables into, you know, C structures in memory and have a really fast C based parser and lexer in there? I don't think it does. I think it all it does it all with Python structures. Okay, so that the opposite question is is it pure Python so that you don't need to compile it? Yes, it is it is Python, pure Python. <clears throat> How robust is it? Do you use it everywhere you use Lex, Lex and Yak? Um, I mean, this is really the only place I've ended up using it, but I, I found it, being familiar with Lex and Yak, I found this extremely straightforward to use, and so I, I could see myself if I had other Python parsing needs turning to this. Just a more general question outside of Python. Have, have you seen applications of, of parsers with any voice recognition programs? No. <laughs> what, what are some examples of other places where you've seen these used? Uh, mainly I've seen parsers used in compilers. When you're writing a compiler, I mean, there, there are probably other things, but it's sort of one of those things where, like, I don't know, <clears throat> the Ruby or Haskell communities would just say, write a domain-specific language. But if you're not into domain-specific languages or want something that's radically different, you know, then writing a parser or writing you know, a compiler for whatever you need is not a bad idea. Any other questions?